So I have resisted the idea of a home lab for a very long time, and I've done so for several reasons. One, home lab equipment can be very expensive, and the reason why I know this is because I watch several YouTube channels where they talk about home labs, and I, you see these YouTubers' home labs, and they all have, like, these gigantic server racks where they, they've spent, obviously, tens of thousands of dollars over the course of years to build this thing up. And I didn't really think that I needed to spend that much money on something like that when I have a ton of computers already, and it's just really, I didn't see the use for one, right? Because I just assumed that they were really exorbitantly expensive. So that was one reason. Another reason was that you do see these like gigantic server racks, and I've heard servers before. Like I, I used to work around IT, and if you've ever heard a server, it kind of sounds like an airport. <laughs> the, the fans in those things are not quiet, so I had no interest in that type of noise in my home. Another is that I already have an electric bill that is north of $300 a month, which is just absolutely ridiculous. And I don't need to add more stuff to that electric bill to make it even higher. So I ha I have resisted home labs. And the final reason, I guess, is and the biggest reason is because I, I have seen what a rabbit hole it can be. Because th once you start, there's so many avenues and paths for you to you know take in to kind of learn new things and you, you just kind of fall down into that rabbit hole and you may never ever come out but if you've watched the podcast the last couple of weeks or you've you know been talking to me on the discord server you'll know that i've finally given it i've decided that i need a home lab and while i'm not going to get a server rack or actual servers i have stepped a toe into the rabbit hole and what I want to do today is kind of talk about some of the things that I've learned over the course of the last couple of weeks. Now, I'm not going to be getting into any technical details today simply because I'm, I don't feel comfortable talking about technical details when I'm just blatantly a noob at all this stuff. So we won't be getting into that, but maybe in the future that's something that we can do. So let's talk about my experiences so far building a home lab. But before we jump in, if you leave a thumbs up on this video, I'd really appreciate it. It'd really help the channel. So when I first decided to do this, I had some ideas and I was willing to take advice, but I was also very much influenced by what I knew I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. The one thing that I absolutely did not want to do was build a computer. I've done that exactly one time in my entire life, building a computer. And I've worked on existing computers, you know, dozens and dozens of times, maybe hundreds of times, but I've never built a computer from bottom to top except for one time, which is the computer I use to this day that sits in front of me. I built it. I have that accomplishment under my belt. I have no interest in building another one. I just don't have the dexterity with my fat fingers to get in there and do those little things that you sometimes need to do when you're building a computer. So I had no interest in building my own home lab for, you know, like computer from scratch. I just, no interest. So my original idea was to get one of those little mini PCs. You know what I'm talking about there? You know, maybe like a four by four box. They have a Ryzen or an Intel CPU in them, integrated graphics. They have a lot of ports along the outside. You can usually put a couple NVMEs in there and they're just, you know, little bitty things. And I, then I could attach some external storage to be my storage pool. That was my original idea, and I enjoyed that idea for multiple reasons. One, all of those things are very low power. They're all very, very quiet, because usually they don't even have a fan, or if they do, it's just one little fan. And I would be able to add ex as much external storage in terms of a JBOD device as I'd want it to. So I could just gra grab a hard drive enclosure, attach it via USB or Thunderbolt or whatever, and I'd be on my way. Now, I have been explicitly told by Josh that that was a bad idea, <laughs> but I was very stubborn and decided that that was the kind of the route that I wanted to go on. But I decided not to do a mini PC because I did want to have some expandability options in, you know, in the future. So I went to eBay and I found a, one of those Dell Optiplex servers from like 12, 13 years ago. It's like a 2011, I think like that. It's very, very old. It was very, very cheap. It was like 150 bucks or whatever. I got that put some extra RAM in it, put an SSD in it, and that's what I decided I was going to use for my home server. And that's where I started. And I did get a JBOD device, which I believe stands for just bring your own 
disc. I think that's what it's called. Um, I'm not, a, <laughs> not actually sure. I just know what they call it, JBOD. This is what I'm talking about. They're, the terminology is still very much a new. But anyways, you it's like an enclosure. You put a whole bunch of hard drives in it. It attaches via USB. I got one of those. I got an 8-bay uh, enclosure, and I've put a, two or three drives in it now. So that's where I am at the moment. And I, in terms of hardware, I am not very happy with my choices and overall. I should have went with a newer computer. That's the first lesson that I've learned is I should have went with a slightly newer computer and I've ordered one. I, I've ordered a Xeon HP workstation from eBay. Slightly more expensive than what I wanted to pay, but it, it also has a lot more memory. So I'll be able to do things like actually use ZFS on internal storage if I want to. Uh, which apparently is something that you can't do with just 16 gigabytes of RAM because ZFS is notoriously you know memory hungry or whatever. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I've never used ZFS before. So I have made this choice and almost automatically found that I made a mistake in terms of the age of the machine. So I should have bought something newer right from the beginning. I would have been $150, you know, uh, richer, I suppose is the way the, the best put it. So I have rectified that mistake eventually i think that i will also be happier with the newer one because it should support a pcie pass through which this one here does not so that should allow me to pass through a graphics card and a network card and all that stuff so in the future if i want to expand i should be able to do so so the first lesson there was buy something a little bit newer i don't think that i would have been any happier buying the mini pc which i thought i was going to at the first at the beginning i think that i'm going to be happier with still the expandability because the the case that i'm getting will have some you know expansion stuff in it but so i think i'm going to be happier going that route than i would have with the mini pc but there's still that little part of my brain that thinks that a mini PC would have been the best way to go. So I don't know. If, if you're looking to go into this route, first off, don't take advice from me. Okay. <laughs> I'm still very much a noob. If you guys are going to follow along with this series of me talking about my home lab, just know very much that I'm learning and I'm going to say shit wrong. It, there, absolutely, I'm going to be, make many, many mistakes along this path. So hopefully that'll be entertaining for you and maybe even informational. But if you're going to do the home lab server, do... What I've basically done is get on YouTube, find as many people who have done this before, and follow as much advice as you can that seems relevant. The problem, of course, is that everyone has different advice, and you got to kind of know who you trust. So hopefully, you've kind of subscribed to somebody who you can uh, have already kind of established that trust with, and you know, you maybe you'll be better off than I was because I, I kind of was new to this completely. So. In terms of hardware, I'm in a state of flux right now. I'm still using the old one. I'm waiting for the new one to come. Uh, and I think that I'm going to be happier with the, with, the, with the newer device. So that's where the hardware is right now. Second, I should talk about the software because the software is really where I've placed most of my hopes and dreams, I guess is the way to put it. So what I did to begin with and what I wanted to do and what turned out to be a, a blatant mistake was to install OpenSUSE on that computer and then use OpenSUSE to basically host my Docker images and my Plex server and all that stuff. I was just going to use the one distro. It would have been fine because the PC is going to be behind me. Now, you guys can't see anymore my standing desk my, my standing desk is still back there and it's that's where the home lab is going to be it's like it's not a home lab you know it's not going to be a server rack but it's going to be back there and i still want to use the standing desk for you know a standing desk so i thought i could just use a regular distro on that machine and then you know still be able to do regular linuxy things on there while you know standing at it and then also use it to host the docker stuff and the plex stuff and all the stuff that i wanted to do kind of in the background i thought i could do that but the one thing overall that i've learned and i already knew this but it's been rubbed into my face you know blatantly over the course of the last two weeks is i know jack shit about docker absolutely nothing now i know more now than i did two weeks ago but it's still negative territory for me i don't know nearly enough and i've not been very successful in learning it is the problem that I've had the most. I royally messed up that OpenSUSE install in terms of Docker. 
I installed Nginx and then I uninstalled Nginx, but Nginx was still in control of the ports, which means I couldn't use any other Dockers. I didn't have any clue how to fix that, nor did a couple of the other people that I talked to, you know, so it was a very messy situation. I'm sure that it could have been fixed if I wanted to find someone who actually, you know, could walk me through it and knew what I did. And the problem is that I did so many different things, kind of just learning by stumbling through in the dark, that I couldn't tell people exactly what I did, which means that it was almost impossible for anyone to walk me through how to fix it. So I was talking to Tyler because he's recently started working on his own home, own home lab as well. And he talked me into using Proxmox on that machine. Now, I, I'm not as happy with Proxmox as I wanted to be, not because Proxmox is bad and I'm still learning. I'm very much a noob. I'll, I'll talk more about Proxmox here in a minute, but it takes away my dream of being able to basically use that computer as just like a regular computer, or at least I think it does. I, I, <laughs> I don't know enough about Proxmox yet to know that what I can actually do with it on that device, because as far as I know, Proxmox is primarily in the web. I don't know what I can actually do on that device. I haven't got there yet. I'm still only like four videos into Learn Linux TV's law, like 16 video series on Proxmox. I'm going through that, you know, video by video as I have time. So maybe along the line, I'll learn that I can do more with that computer, you know, actually on the computer and I can use like a VM or something while there and it will work better than using a VM does in the, you know, the, the web browser because it doesn't work very well in a web browser. And I also learned that the hardware that I have now doesn't support PCI pass-through, so I couldn't get any of my uh, the graphics card to actually pass through, which wasn't a big deal. I didn't really expect it to, but I, once I saw someone else do it, I was like, oh yeah, I want to do that too, and I found out that I couldn't. So I've been learning Proxmox. Actually, you guys can see, if I go here to my uh, desktop here, uh, this is my Proxmox server right here, and I, I will <laughs> I, I'll blatantly just absolutely say I'm still very much a noob. I have created my first uh, VM in it. I've already also already deleted it because <laughs> just absolutely don't install at least without having PCI threat pass through or something. I don't know, or at least follow all the directions before you hop in. I don't. I I installed regular Ubuntu LTS, like regular with GNOME and everything. Not a good idea. It worked. It actually worked fairly well. I could actually see it in the the browser and everything. It, it worked like some remote software you've seen in the past where you kind of, it, it kind of puts up a monitor for you and it, it's fine, but I don't think that it's going to work very well, at least as is for like a graphical situation. I kind of had hopes where I could use this to test distros for the channel and I still may be able to figure out how to do that because like I said, I'm still very much a noob. But I will say that so far, it looks like it's going to be mostly terminal based, which is, you know, fine. But if, if I wanted to do anything for the GUI, it's going to be slowed down a little bit. I'm still very much a noob when it comes to Proxmox. But my dream for being able to do this is to be able to have a couple VMs. One, two control the storage because I do still have that JBOD device with all the, the drives and the drive empty drive bays as they are right now and I'm going to create some a software raid inside of a VM and then be, hopefully be able to share that via NFS with another VM and with my main machine here that's my hope and I think that I that that's possible so that's one VM that I'm going to do and the other one will be to host all of my Docker stuff that I'm going to be playing around with. Hopefully, as I learn that, it will be to host the Plex server that I want to get back up and running. All that stuff. So, that's where I am right now. Now, I know that Proxmox has the ability to create containers. And I've been told that containers allow you to use the GPU without pass-through or something like that. I'm not sure if that's true. I've just been told that on Mastodon. So, that's something that I still have to kind of uh, explore. And also, I haven't got that far in the tutorial yet or in the, in the course yet. So... We'll see how that goes. So maybe containers are a better idea for the things that I need to do. I don't know yet. It's just something that I'm going to learn. So in terms of software, the actual rabbit hole is just beginning. So I'm, I'm just learning Proxmox. I've kind of read a little bit about Unraid because I thought Unraid maybe be a might be a better alternative than Proxmox because I don't know that I really need the virtualization part, even though Unraid has some virtualization like options, but it's not as good as Proxmox, but it does do a better job of managing, you know, storage and it allows you to basically 
automatically install a whole bunch of Docker containers and stuff like that. That has They have a whole bunch of apps and stuff. So I thought maybe that was an option. I've been looking at that. I thought about TrueNAS on top of Proxmox, but they don't, it doesn't seem that Prox or that TrueNAS does a very good job of supporting USB connected devices. Because that's one thing that, like Josh told me, that you should definitely not use USB connected devices storage you should you shouldn't do it because it's not as stable there's a lot of points of failure and stuff like that i've known that for 20 years that usb connected storage isn't as stable as internally connected storage but i've been using usb connected storage for 20 years and i have a good backup strategy it should be fine and i'm i'm hoping that that remains true but everywhere you learn and it's not just josh telling me this but everywhere everywhere you see on the internet people say don't use usb connected storage and truenas doesn't even really support uh external storage in terms of usb connected stuff so uh, truenas really doesn't look like it's going to be an option for me at the moment maybe i'm still like i said still in, at the learning stages so maybe that's something that i can do i do know that unraid does support them so that maybe that's an option because you can use Unraid on top of Proxmox if you want to, although I wouldn't be able to do it with this machine because I need to give it some more memory and I only have 16 gigabytes right now. So this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> I have a long ways to go. I'm still very much a noob. Like not, I don't even think I could qualify as a noob right now. Noobs, even noobs know something. Right now, I still feel like I know nothing. And that's going to be the issue is that I have a lot of stuff to learn. And this is a very large rabbit hole that I've gotten myself into. I have a lot of hopes and dreams and plans and stuff going on in my brain of things that I really, really want to do. I don't know how to do any of it yet. And it should be it should be fun, but also probably a little stressful because not only is there a lot of stuff to learn, but there's a lot of there's not a lot of consensus on how to learn those things because everything has in traditional Linux fashion 12 different ways of doing it. And you know, which one's the best? Nobody knows. They're all going to argue about it. And here's Matt. Like, I just, just show me the best way. Show me the thing that I should do. This is how you do it and carry on with my day. That's what I want to do. But, you know, Learn Linux TV has a lot of awesome courses on how to do stuff. And I'm going to follow most of his stuff because he seems to know what he's doing. Uh, but if you look at, you know, if you do a Google or a YouTube search for other people who've done Proxmox, you're going to find dozens of other people who have done this and they all do it in a certain different way because they all have different hardware configurations they all have different recommendations and advice and all this stuff and it's very very confusing <laughs> it's kind of like having it's kind of like installing gen 2 on a live stream and having 12 people in the live chat telling you how to do it because they all have different ways of doing it so here's the deal i'm going to be doing some videos on home lab stuff if that's something that interests you and you have ideas for things that I might possibly be interested in making videos about, leave those in the comment section below. I don't guarantee anything because I'm, I still have a lot of my own interests that I kind of want to go on and make videos and content about, but maybe you guys can spark some ideas in the comment section below. If you have any other thoughts on my home lab journey, beginning as it is, you can leave those in the comment section below as well. If you haven't hit the subscribe button, do that now because it would really help the channel and you'll get some awesome Linux content as a reward. So that's it for this one. You can follow me on Mastodon or Odyssey. Those links will be in the video description. You can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Linux cast. You can also support me on Ko-fi and on the YouTube join button down there below my face. If you want to support me monetarily, you can also head on over to the shop, which is available at shop.thelinuxcast.org. There you'll find awesome merch, including hats and t-shirts and desk mats and hoodies and stickers and all sorts of stuff. All the proceeds for that go directly towards helping me make more Linux content for you guys and staying on schedule and all that stuff. So if you have purchased some merch for me, thank you so very much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. Thanks, everybody who does support me on Patreon, YouTube, and Ko-fi. You guys are all absolutely amazing. Without you, the channel just would not be anywhere near where it is right now. So thank you so very much for your support. And also, just for those of you who don't support me on Patreon... Uh, just to let you know, I do a weekly Patreon-exclusive podcast. So head on over to Patreon. You can see all the previous versions of that podcast there. It's available to all tiers. So um, give me some support. Get a podcast in return. So thanks, everybody, for your support. Thanks, everybody, for watching. I'll see you next time.